Okay, so welcome everyone to our second um, lecture um, with our wonderful um, Chair of Rural Medicine with Gateway, uh, Dr. Ken Milne, going to give this presentation on discussing some of the misinformation surrounding COVID-19 pandemic. Um, I am the president of Gateway, and um, I also get the honor not only to welcome you, but to welcome all the panelists uh, here that we have today. So I will start with um, Bonnie Bainham, who is on our Gateway board. And um, so welcome, Bonnie. She brings tremendous insight to what's happening out there in the community. Um, Patricia Robinson, um, she is a, a nurse practitioner and again will perhaps bring views of what she's hearing in the neighborhood uh, on, on COVID misinformation. Um, she also uh, has wonderful maple syrup, just putting a plug in there for you, Patricia. Um, and um, our mayor, John Grace, who is always a delight uh, to work with, uh, mayor of Godrich. And thank you to John for joining us today in this interesting topic and perhaps uh, discuss what some of your people are thinking out there in the community as well as um, misinformation, myths and so on. And Kristen Watt, who has shared with us that she has now had her vaccinations for COVID and is a rural pharmacist and will bring us her perspective as well. So um, I thank you all. I need to make a disclaimer that the views and opinions expressed during the session are those of speakers and panelists um, are not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of Gateway uh, or their representative organization. So I'm delighted to um, send this now to Dr. Ken Milne, uh, who is uh, going to do the presentation today and is staring at me with his first slide with that very large eye, which you are all seeing as well. I've known Ken for a, a very long time, and I am thrilled that he is um, joining us today to do the presentation. So I'm going to go mute now and let you take it over there, Ken. Thank you, Gwen, and I'll thank Gateway for inviting me to give this second lecture in a monthly series. So this is the second lecture. There was one last month. This is this month's, but every Tuesday you can tune in for another Gateway lecture. So I would encourage you, if you like this one, tune in next week or next month. If you don't like this one, tune in next month. Uh, the title of my talk is Health Information, Who and What to Trust. And I did promise that I would start with a mesmerizing story. So I have a story to mesmerize you to kick this uh, lecture off. But before we get started, I have to disclose my conflicts of interest. And basically, I'm a big nerd who takes no money from any industry. Conflicts of interest. All right, so here's what we're going to be talking about in today's gateway lecture. The first thing I want to do is mesmerize you with a story, talk about science in general, and then specifically address the concept of evidence-based medicine. And then I'm going to ask you to reflect upon this infodemic of COVID-19 and talk about who and what to trust, and then give you some tools on how to spot BS health claims. Yes, the BS stands for what you think it stands for, but I didn't want to get in trouble with Gateway. But it also stands for BS as in bad science. So I'm going to be talking about how to spot BS, but also how to spot bad science. But I promise to start the lecture with a mesmerizing story. So with all the funding and special effects that were provided with Gateway, we are going to time travel. Doodle -doo, doodle -doo, doodle -doo. This story takes place 200 years ago in Europe in the 1780s. And there was a famous German physician named Friedrich Anton Mesmer. Now, Dr. Mesmer claimed he could heal people through animal magnetism. And he moved from Germany 
to France and became very popular. Dr. Mesmer was actually so popular that he needed to host these banquet tables to treat people. Now the treatment itself involved a large tub containing magnetized iron filings. And during the therapy session, the room was filled with haunting music. And some people would hold hands while Dr. Mesmer would appear in this bright purple robe and perform something similar to hypnosis. And he would give people healing suggestions and then touch them with this metal rod, commanding them to be cured. And one of his famous patrons in France was this beautiful woman, Marie Antoinette. Now, King Louis XVI, that's the picture on the left. King Louis XVI of France was not happy about all the time and money Marie Antoinette was spending with Dr. Mesmer. The king then created a royal commission to investigate Dr. Mesmer's magnetic treatment. One of the leading scientists of the day was the American Benjamin Franklin. He's the gentleman on the right. Now, he conducted experiments on Dr. Mesmer's technique, but the twist, the twist in there was that he put blindfolds on the patients. So they didn't know if the magnetized iron filings were present or not during the therapy session. Now, the key result from the experiment when people were physically blindfolded was that there was no difference whether or not the magnetic iron filings were present. The Royal Commission's conclusions were there was nothing to Dr. Mesmer's magnet therapy. So say it with me, people. I know this is a Zoom meeting, but you can shout it out. What were people having? They were being mesmerized. It was an elaborate placebo effect. And this is where the term mesmerization comes from. It's also where we get the term blinded trial. It comes from people who were actually wearing blindfolds. And blinding of subjects in research studies is a key quality indicator whether or not to consider the health claim valid. Were the participants blinded to the treatment or not? If not, it could introduce bias. And when I say bias, I'm talking about something that systematically moves us away from the quote unquote truth in the form of a placebo effect. Now we are way too smart to be mesmerized. We live in the 21st century, we have modern science, Yet despite this, people can still be fooled. And this was beautifully illustrated by the power balance story. Did anyone own one of these expensive silicon rubber bands with holograms on them? I'm sure Kristen Watt doesn't carry these in her pharmacy. The makers of this power balance device claimed it could improve your balance, your strength, your flexibility, and professional athletes and movie stars wore them and promoted them. But then a skeptical group from Australia sued the company and won. Power Balance had to remove their health claims and offer refunds. The placebo effect is real. I don't want to minimize the placebo effect. It is a powerful thing for subjective findings. But it's why we need to do blinded trials to try to minimize we can't eliminate, to minimize this type of bias, or we could easily fool ourselves again. So what is science? Well, when I'm using the term science, I'm talking about a method, the most reliable method we've found so far for exploring the natural world. And there are some key qualities to science. It is usually iterative. It is self-correcting. And it should be proportional. So iterative, self-correcting, and proportional. And I'll expand on each of these points shortly. What science isn't is certain. Science provides a tentative position, an approximate answer. And these are subject to change when better science is produced. Science does not make truth claims. 
Science is a method for exploring the natural world. Science doesn't care what you believe because science has no agency. However, scientists, our humans, have agency, make mistakes, and are flawed. Just like me, who's wearing this t-shirt in the picture. And here are some other qualities of science. It's usually iterative. Sometimes it takes giant leaps, but it's usually baby steps. And you've probably heard the phrase standing on the shoulders of giants. This picture on the left is derived from Greek mythology. The blind giant Orion carried a servant on his shoulders to act as the giant's eyes. The more familiar expression in English comes from Sir Isaac Newton, who said, quote, if I've seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. So science typically is iterative, making advances based on the work of previous scientists. And science is, science is also self-correcting. Science gets updated. We hopefully learn. Medical treatments that were thought to work can be reversed. And during my 25 year medical career, I've seen things come and go. And you need to practice medicine long enough to see this cycle. And time is a great teacher of humility. So we know scientists were wrong and the only way we know they're wrong is because they were right later. So science works. And in my disclosure slide, I did say I was a big nerd. And so here's my Star Trek meme. I love this meme about science. Science was proven wrong. By what? More science. That's how science works. And a final part of science that I wanted to discuss was proportionality. The evidence required to accept a claim should be, in part, proportional to the claim itself. The classic example was given by the famous scientist Carl Sagan. And Sagan made the claim that there was a fire-breathing dragon that lives in his garage. Think about that. How much evidence would it take for you to accept that claim? Would you take Carl Sagan on his word? Would you need pictures, videos? Bones, some other biological evidence? How about the pretest probability? Have you ever seen a dragon, let alone a dragon that breathes fire? Now contrast that to if Carl Sagan had said, I have a puppy in my garage. You'd probably take his word for it. We're expecting a puppy in the next couple of months, actually. There's nothing extraordinary about that claim. Most of you should be familiar with a puppy. So when considering a healthcare claim, consider whether or not it is extraordinary. Is somebody saying they can cure COVID with essential oils? That seems extraordinary to me. The summary of Carl Sagan's position is extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. So now let's get off the idea of science and focus in on evidence-based medicine. And this was defined by David Sackett 25 years ago. And he defined EBM as the conscientious, explicit, and judicious use of the current best evidence in making decisions about the care of individual patients. And each of those words is very important. Talking about the clinician needing to be conscientious and explicit about what they're doing, using their good clinical judgment, searching for the best evidence so patients get the best care, and treating patients as an individual, not as a number, not as a percentage, but as a unique individual. And this definition has been summarized into a Venn diagram that has three pillars. Here's the Venn diagram that represents the three pillars of the definition of evidence-based medicine. The literature is down there in the blue, and the literature should inform clinicians' care, but it shouldn't dictate care. The green circle is clinical judgment. Clinicians still need to reflect on their experience and use their good clinical judgment implying the literature. And then the red circle, this is very, very important. The patients, what do they value and what do they prefer? And when I teach this, I say, you know, the best way to know what patients want 
ask them. So these three components make up evidence-based medicine, the literature, clinical judgment, and patients' values and preferences. And there is a hierarchy to medical evidence, and we want clinicians to use the best evidence as the definition of evidence-based medicine advocates. This is usually described as a perfect pyramid, but I see we've got the mayor here. I prefer this stack of rocks on the shores of Lake Huron. I mean, you can see they're not perfect. They have flaws, but they're beautiful. And each level of evidence represents a higher level of evidence. Now, the lowest is expert opinion. That can be right or wrong. But if we have a higher level of evidence, and that's in the middle there, that's randomized control trials. But randomized control trials are not the be all and end all of evidence based medicine. They're not the highest form of evidence. And they can be flawed, they have limitations, and they may or may not be correct. Now, at the top is considered systematic reviews. But you need to look at each study individually. Just because it's published doesn't mean it's true. Just because it's a randomized control trial doesn't mean it's true. But as you go up, the probability of it being the best point estimate of an effect size is more likely to be correct. But I would rather take a great randomized control trial over a poorly done systematic review. And this is explained in this concept. So systematic reviews, it's where you take all the existing evidence and decide whether or not to mash it up and put it together. But that can result in something called GIGO. That stands for garbage in, garbage out. It means if you use a whole bunch of crappy little studies, mash them up into, let's say, a meat grinder and produce a sausage, it may spit out some result with an, an impressive p-value but this is the illusion of certainty when certainty certainly does not exist. To use an example, I grew up on an apple farm. My mom made the best apple pies ever. This is a hill I will die on. And this is because she used great ingredients, wonderful apples, unrefined sugar, cinnamon, and made it with that special ingredient, love. But if you take all those wonderful apples, those ingredients, and add them with a cow pie, something that comes out of the back of a cow, adding a cow pie to an apple pie does not make the apple pie taste any better. All you get is a poop emoji. All right, so there are limitations to evidence-based medicine. I'm not presenting them today. Regardless of the limitations. This is how I feel about evidence-based medicine. And remember, it's about the literature, it's about the clinician, but it's also key, it's about the patient. But it's the worst form of evidence, it's the worst form of medicine, except all others that have been tried. All right, time to talk a little bit about COVID-19 and specifically about the communication over the last year. Yeah, it's been a bit of a dumpster fire. At least that's my impression. I mean, look at the messaging on masks. Should I wear a cloth mask, a medical mask, an N95 mask? Should I wear more than one mask? Is this source control? Is this personal prevention? All of these issues around the masking messaging. And then don't get me started on social distancing. It is physical distancing. We need to stay socially connected more than ever during a pandemic for our mental well being while maintaining our physical distance. And I'm thankful to Gateway for having this lecture series so we can come together virtually. And I can see some of my friends like Kristen Watt and stay socially connected. And then, you know, therapeutics, that's her wheelhouse. I mean, hydroxychloroquine, vitamin D, steroids, zincs, vaccines. I'm sure she is getting peppered with questions on a daily basis about these things. So who and what do you trust? And to avoid any confusion and being labeled against vaccination, here's my view on the topic of vaccination. Yes, another t-shirt. Vaccines cause adults. And it's amazing how quickly they've been developed. Multiple COVID-19 vaccines. Now there's still many unknowns, like how long will it last? 
Is one shot good enough or do I need the two shot vax? Rare side effects. But remember, science is never finished. Like I said, it's iterative, it's progressive. But scientists developing these vaccines are standing on the shoulders of giants. Vaccination is one of the greatest treatments ever invented. It is one of the reasons we're living twice as long roughly at this turn of the century in, 20, in the 21st century compared to the 20th century. But back to COVID-19 and the global pandemic, whoa, we are getting overloaded with COVID-19 information. It can seem like at times we're drinking from a fire hose. There have been, and I have to say this in my best Dr. Evil voice, millions and millions of articles in traditional media about COVID-19. And a large number of these articles have been considered misinformation. This large amount of misinformation has been coined the infodemic. With regards to scientific publications, just know your clinician is, ex is facing more than 200 articles published every day in the medical literature. Is your clinician keeping up to this tsunami of medical literature? I'm not reading 200 articles a day. And don't even get me started about social media, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, TikTok. Never in human history have we had so much information and so much misinformation. It can be exhausting at times and overwhelming. So here we are. How do you spot BS? You need to be able to be spot BS. And by BS, I mean what you think it means. And I'll talk about BS health claims. But also BS to me means bad science. And I'm going to give you some things to watch for in social media and regular media. Some tips, some red flags, some key things that whoop, 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 should set off your skeptical radar. So let's start with bandwagon. Just because it's popular doesn't mean it's the right thing to do. Lots of people used to smoke. Does that make smoking good for your health? No, it just means lots of people smoked. Large number of people are saying that they take or recommend using vitamin D, zinc, oregano oil, etc., to prevent COVID-19. That does not mean those therapies work. Think of it this way, and I brought my mother up before, and I have some vague recollections of this. Do you remember when your mother told you as a teenager, if all the other kids were jumping off the cliff, Kenny, would you jump off too? Large numbers of people taking vitamin D does not mean vitamin D works for COVID-19. The only thing we can conclude is that a lot of people are taking vitamin D. What matters more is high quality evidence of efficacy. And until such data is presented, we would be wise to be skeptical. And a new way is not necessarily better or worse in treating COVID-19. But the reverse is also true. An old way is not necessarily better or worse. Some people claim that hydroxychloroquine, which is an old fashioned drug used to treat malaria and a few other conditions, can treat COVID-19. While others say these fancy new things like immunotherapies work for COVID-19. What matters more is not whether something is old or a new treatment, but rather if there's high quality evidence to support the claim. Turns out the best evidence we have in treating COVID-19 right now to decrease mortality is an old fashioned steroid, dexamethasone. And a fancy new technology like messenger RNA vaccines to prevent getting COVID-19. So don't be fooled by healthcare claims just because the treatment is old or natural or new, some fancy technology. What matters is, is it effective? So be skeptical. And don't forget that every intervention has the potential benefit and has potential harms. If you're reading a health story and it only reports the benefits, you should be more skeptical that it might be BS. We want to see if something works. But more importantly, we want to see the net effect, the net impact of an intervention. If some people are helped with a treatment, but more people die overall or suffer serious side effects, 
that would not be considered a great therapy. So we have to consider both sides of the coin. What are the potential benefits to the therapy and what are the potential harms? And if they're only talking about benefits, hmm, why haven't they mentioned harm? Every biological intervention, if it has biological interaction, has potential harms. And another way to spot BS is when a story cherry picks the results. Think to yourself, is this study an outlier? What is the scientific consensus on the topic? Now, a scientific consensus does not mean that the scientific consensus is correct. And there are examples where the scientific consensus was incorrect. But the probability that one study overturns all other research is rare. Extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Science is never done. Other scientists need to replicate and confirm the evidence and interpretation of the results. Just cherry picking one study to represent the whole picture is dangerous. And oh, your skeptical radar should go off if the person making the healthcare claim has a financial conflict of interest with the treatment recommendation. Now, having financial conflicts of interest can bias somebody's interpretation and reporting of health claims. It's usually a good idea to follow the money. If the person promoting the treatment stands to make a lot of money, you should ask yourself, is this person full of BS? Now, it doesn't make the claim wrong, but it should make us more skeptical of the claim. Do you have any evidence? Well, I have these anecdotes. That's not good enough. I hope you like that meme there, Kristen. I can't always use 80s themes. EBM advocates for patients to get the best care based on the best evidence. Testimonials and anecdotes of personal stories are powerful narratives. However, they do not represent high quality evidence and are not a reliable way of assessing the efficacy of treatments. These types of health claims should be considered hypothesis generating. We shouldn't just dismiss them. Hypothesis generating anecdotes actually inform us to say, hey, let's take a closer look at this. But it should help us form a hypothesis. And then we should confirm the hypothesis of these anecdotes with better science. I don't invalidate a person's experience with a treatment, but I will question their interpretation of the experience. I'm glad that they felt better. I'm glad that they feel better. I'm glad that they're doing better. But I want to know why are they doing better? And I'm not done with just one anecdote. Also, the number of anecdotes does not necessarily make the claim more true. The plural of anecdotes is not data. Be skeptical if the health claim is only based on anecdotes. And I've been disappointed to see what seems like science via press release during COVID-19. There were multiple examples of press releases circulating without a peer-reviewed paper or even a pre-print publication. And there are problems with peer review. Peer review is not even close to being perfect. Not that I expect it to be, but it's not. But it is a higher standard than a press release. Also, press releases do not make the information right or wrong, but should make us more skeptical if the claim does not come attached with a peer-reviewed publication linked to the release. So I like to say, what do we want? Evidence-based science. When do we want it? After peer review. Now, this is another one of my favorite t-shirts to wear. And when trying to spot BS, bad science, look to see if there's a control group. This can be a compared to placebo, there can be a sham intervention, or some active comparator. Without something to compare the intervention to, it's difficult to know if the treatment is better, worse, or the same as standard care. And we've seen multiple observational studies published around COVID-19 that did not have a control group. This is not high quality science. Patients deserve better. And blinding. We, we spoke about blinding at the very beginning of this lecture. So this is a bit of spaced repetition. I told the story of Dr. Mesmer and Benjamin Franklin conducting a single blinded trial. A single blinded trial is where the patient is blinded. They don't know whether they're getting the active treatment 
or the comparator, the sham, or the placebo. A double-blinded trial, both the patient and the clinician, they don't know which group the patient is in. And there is even a triple-blinded trial, and that's when the outcome assessor is also blinded. Blinding helps minimize bias and is a quality indicator. If the study does not say it was a blinded trial, be more skeptical. It might be bad science. Another way to spot BS or bad science is a lack of randomization. This is a form of cherry picking, which I mentioned earlier. Picking subjects uh, specifically can introduce bias. It's formally called selection bias. If the study did not adequately randomize the patients, the researchers could consciously or unconsciously skew the results. And randomization is a key aspect of good science. And then correlation is not causation. This is another fundamental way to spot BS in health claims. If the person confuses correlation with causation, the claiming something was caused by a treatment, I'd be very skeptical. There have been many observational studies done in COVID-19. Unless it was a randomized control trial, causation cannot be concluded. An observational study where the researcher just looks at what patients received and how they did only tells you about associations or correlations, not causation. There can be many unmeasured factors that can influence the results of an observational study. This is why randomization is so critical and represents, oh, this is another BS, better science. There we go. All right, so here's a great website. I love this website. I put the link down at the bottom. It is a post about spurious correlations and it illustrates just how crazy correlations can be, but they can be very convincing. I picked one example, and this is the number of people who drowned by falling into a pool. And that correlates with the number of films Nicolas Cage appeared in that year. Now, no one should conclude that Nicolas Cage films cause pool drownings. So check out this link. I think you'll find some very funny correlations. So I'm coming up to the end of my half hour, which I was told I would be given. Here are some of the tools with examples of how to spot BS health claims and spotting other BS i.e. bad science. And these tips came from Vox. That's the table in the blue, how to spot BS health claims. And it describes six ways to spot BS. Now, of course, it's a bit more nuanced than that. And hopefully I've provided that nuance in this presentation. And there are also this orange infographic on the right. And this was made by Compound Chem. And it's called a rough guide to spotting bad science. And it has a dozen ways to spot bad science. And these are great tools that can help you filter the signal from all of the noise generated from the COVID-19 infodemic. So my final advice on who and what to trust during COVID-19, well, I'd say be skeptical of any health claim, not just about COVID-19, including if you heard it from a nerd like me. Thank you very much. And now I think we're going to go on to our panel discussion. And so I will end my screen sharing. Or I will try to stop <laughs> my screen sharing, which is always interesting. Ken, that was really wonderful. Thank you for that. Um, there, you are right. There is so much in the media. And I think what I was thinking we could do in the panel, and I know Jay can jump on here, and uh, perhaps there's questions from our viewers. I know we have several more joining us today. Uh, and perhaps there's some that we could put to the panel. Uh, or we could let you handle the panel as you want. Ken, I was wondering if we kind of wanted to hear from them what they're hearing in the community and what are maybe our big issues in misinformation. 
So I'll, I will let you take that away. Jay, are there any questions now or do we welcome any questions from our, from those at home? Yeah, there, there's no questions. Oh, one just popped up in the question. So, answer. If, so if Jay, anyone does, I, yeah, Jay and Gwen, I, I will say thank you for uh, uh, having the flexibility to do this way. There is wisdom on this panel. And just like the evidence-based medicine model, uh, I'm really an expert at the literature and nerdy stuff like that. I've got clinical experience, like the rest of our panel has clinical experience or life experience. But what I'd really like to bring in in the last half hour would be, what does the general public think? I would really like to engage with them and get their wisdom about how they've been perceiving this global pandemic and this infodemic. Fabulous. Well, will we let, Jay, will we start out with a open panel discussion um, or one of the questions that you have and welcome more questions from everyone. Well, I see the yeah. first question is, can Ken and any of the panel members share how you deal with skeptics who deny COVID-19 and reject masking and distancing? Discuss. I'd like to chime in. So I have long used social media platforms for uh, one might say arguing uh, or debating or sharing information. And someone said something to me this year that changed my life. I guess it was last year. It's all a blur now. Is it not still March, 2020? Someone said something to me that changed my life. And it was this, you don't have to win. This isn't an argument between, it's not a lover's quarrel. It's not my kids getting them to do something. I don't need to win. I'm going to share with them the best information that I have in the moment that I have it and move on. It is not my job to convince other people of the facts. It is my job as a community pharmacist to share the facts as I know them in the moment, share the science as I know it at that time, and then move on. People will make their own decisions regardless of what I say or don't say. My job is to share the best evidence that we have at the time. Sometimes it's really important, I find, to share that information because there are fence sitters who aren't commenting, who aren't asking, and they are the people who are going to take away from what I say and make hopefully a better choice about distancing, masking, or vaccination. So I still like to share it. I do engage, but I also know where the shutoff is. I don't have to win. We don't have to continue to go back and forth. It doesn't have to eat up my night. Here's the information, and I move on. Yeah, uh, and I agree with that. As, as a mayor of a community that that uh, is challenged by this a lot in Godrich, whether it's uh, the beach during the summertime when we see massive amounts of people and we still open the beach, how do we message um, and what do we say? And I went by the principle of, instead of BS, uh, KISS. Uh, I know you, you, you like uh, uh, your arguments. Uh, KISS is just keep it simple, okay? Um, and I learned right from the beginning, when this started, don't pretend you're a, you're a healthcare profession, uh, professional, John. You're not. I'm just like everyone else in the community. I'm just an everyday ordinary Joe. I just so happen to be mayor. And I can't be what people think I ought to be. I can only be John Grace, the mayor. Keep it simple and keep my message specifically from one source. And I get inundated, people send me stuff all the time. You should think about this, you should think about that. Delete, delete, delete. My message comes from HPPH and my own um, personal doctor, Sam. Other than that, uh, I leave all the rest of the, uh, the skeptics and the conversations and debates to other people. I can only speak to what I know and, and uh, I'm not out there to win. People try to drag me into conversations. I'm not going. I need to keep my community safe. I need to keep my community feeling positive and engaged and healthy. So my messages, if you look on my Facebook posts, are positive. They're, they're simple. Um, and I leave it, leave it there. Uh, that's that's all I can do as a mayor. I'm I'm not a doctor. Well, I um, 
I like some of those things that you brought up, the KISS principle, of course. And Kristen Watt, I, I follow her on Twitter. I would encourage you to as well as a, um, a reliable source of uh, health information. I approach it a little bit different than Kristen. I, I sort of coat mine with a lot of kindness as well, because I, I want to try to understand why. And I'm not saying you're unkind. I'm just you're very direct, right? With regards to your message. And that's an effective technique. Mine is also to understand why, where is this information coming from? Why are they, um, why do they hold a different viewpoint and to inquire and ask questions? And again, I agree with Kristen, I'm not trying to change the hearts and minds of maybe the individual that I'm engaging with, but there's a large audience that's watching and that's the audience that I'm trying to reach often is just to see there are rational arguments being put in and put out there and discussed. Um, I always say you can, you can disagree, but you don't have to be disagreeable online. We have another question that came in from a uh, physician um, in the United States, uh, Dr. Joe Lex. And he's talking about free open access to medical education. And this, of course, is part of the social media that has changed our world. And it's nearly a decade old, at least when it comes to medical education. And he's asking, how has it changed the way that scientists accept or reject new information? I will start by saying just because it was in a tweet doesn't make it right. And it doesn't make it wrong. What matters is the evidence. I don't care about the platform. And I actually don't care too much about the person making the claim. What I care about is, is there evidence to support the position or not? And is it good evidence? And what are the limitations to that evidence? Does anybody else um, have an idea about how has changed the way scientists accept or reject new information because of online platforms and social media? I'll take that as a no. Um, we have another question here. Thank you for reviewing for the review. See, I'm not wearing my old man glasses. I could get them out. Thank you for uh, reviewing and determining truth before, and truth. I should put in quote before COVID science took a bad rap. How can we get evidence-based science back into the mainstream? Anybody have a response to how can we get evidence-based science back into the mainstream? I think that it's really important to be good science communicators. We have an obligation as a health professional community to do that. Um, there's a, so many people don't go past a certain level of science education, um, statistics, understanding, um, all of those things. So the way that we as scientists communicate is really important and we need to bring our message out because the media reports with the media reports. They have their own obligations to their uh, advertisers, to their platform, et cetera. So if we can get our message to them, which is what I've done a lot um, through COVID, um, going on radio shows, TV shows, et cetera, uh, lamp or no lamp in the background, I'm out there because it's important to hear from the people on the ground and share that evidence-based um, scientific information. Hearing it from a press release or from a reporter doesn't always get the best information out there. And I'm going to uh, express some humility like John Grace did when he talked about, hey, I'm a regular guy. I'm trying to get through this. I just happen to be the leader of the community during the pandemic. I think scientists also need to express that similar form of humility and be able to say, I don't know. I don't have enough information to have an opinion on that, or there's not enough information to tell you one way or the other. And that transparency and that being honest and saying, listen, we're doing the best we can to echo what Kristen said earlier with the best information we had at the time that we responded. If you look back um, to March of 2020, John, I'm sure there are things you did not then that you may not do now because you have more information but we can't get all high and mighty and point our fingers at the mayor and say, you, you know, whatever. Um, you were doing the best you could at the time with the best information you had. And science does progress. It is iterative. And as new science informs our positions, 
we should change our positions and we should update and modify and be flexible and humi have the humility to say, yeah, um, we've got more information now and this is what we're going to do. But also key to that is to say, I don't know. I'll try to find out, but I don't know. And I don't know if anybody knows. All right. More chats here. Anybody else want to comment on, on that about being comfortable saying, I don't know? I think absolutely. that and oh, I'll go for one. Oh, sorry. I was just going to say absolutely. Like within the community, um, I do work with public health. Um, and I think, you know, a really important piece of all of this is the relationships that we develop with our communities and build those trusting relationships. So like I think about opportunities um, that Gateway's offering like today and how important that is for people to actually see um, those of us that are out working in the community, whether you're a mayor or a physician, um, and have an opportunity to really understand who we are and to carry that humility with us. It's like we're learning too, we're doing the best we can. Um, but you know, having forums where people can come and ask questions of people that they, they recognize, know, trust is, is really paramount. Um, through public health, I've been noticing a, a shift. This is just my personal thoughts. Um, a bit of a shift from some of the messaging we've been hearing from community around that mistrust um, and questioning, you know, freedoms and liberties and, and things like that to more of a shift of tell us more about vaccines. How do we get this vaccine? You know, we're ready now. Um, so somewhere along the line between community at all levels, that trust is being developed, I think, uh, at least in, in here and in Perth, as far as I, I can tell. Kristen, you wanted to say something there? I think uh, we also need to focus our use, uh, our way that we communicate the message. I was asked to moderate a um, Facebook group for the Grey Bruce region on COVID information. And I cautioned other moderators as we got into it that we should pick um, a certain um, resource, for example, Public Health, uh, Health Canada and Ontario Public Health as our only resources that we referred to. And we don't refer back necessarily to media posts and things like that. We will answer questions about them, but all of our answers come with those references. So it doesn't come across that this is just my opinion. And here's the sources that we're using to reference us at the time. And as things change, we then update the recommendations. Myself, I was guilty of uh, believing certain things. And as things changed last January, I put a post on my store Facebook page, worried about COVID-19 you better get your flu shot because you're more likely to contract that and have that illness. And my, oh my, did things ever change? And it's good to acknowledge that as things change um, and, and to, to be real to the people in front of us that we provide these answers to. But that's one of the reasons people trust you. And I uh, think you're so great is because to be able to admit we were mistaken in the past and acknowledge that and move forward. I think that builds trust with the community and the people we're trying to serve and help. I don't think people are expecting perfection from their leaders and from their healthcare uh, providers. I think what they're trying, uh, what they're looking for is that you're trying and that you care and that you're doing the best thing you can do and recognize you're still a person too. You're still flawed. You still may not get it right, but uh, acknowledging when you haven't got it right and addressing it early and, uh, and changing, I think, is a real sign of intelligence and uh, great communication skills. I Just noticed to add we... in mm -hmm. to and kind of summarize what people have said, I've been asked a number of times over the past year, kind of where or how do I deal with all this information? There's different conflicting reports about everything that's being said about COVID. And picking one source of information, like Kristen just said, um, and sticking with that um, because, and that's reputable. So like a public health or public health Ontario or Canadian public health agency um, is super important. It limits what you're want to read in the media, et cetera. It's not to say that you can't show some interest in those breaking news stories, but it's probably not the best evidence. Um, whereas somebody's done that hard work of going through those studies and summarized not to say that government's always perfect, but uh, generally if we're putting it out in uh, um, the media as public health or agency, then there's been multiple scientists have reviewed that information and it can be supported by evidence. 
Trisha, we are like so simpatico right now because I was looking at the time saying uh, we have 10 minutes left. I'd like to go through the panel and ask them to give at least one example, a minimum of one example of what resource they would direct the public to with regards to reliable health information. And it'll get harder as we go through the panel because some of the people might pick the early easy ones. So we'll start with Bonnie. Bonnie, do you have a reputable, reliable, consistently good source of information that you could direct people to? Absolutely. At least in here in Perth and Ontario, I do, I think. So I, and of course I'm a little biased because I work for here in Perth Public Health, but our website, um, as John had mentioned, is hpph.ca. And I would also um, send people to ontario.ca. Both websites are kept very current and very up to date. Um, locally, our website is updated six out of seven days of the week. Thank you, Bonnie. Uh, Mayor Grace, would you like to uh, give a reputable source? Yeah, and it's really about consistency, the way that I look at it. And, and whether it's repetitive or not uh, is, is okay. Uh, and the consistency of the messaging, although it changes uh, from time to time, from uh, here in Perth Public Health, is where I go, where I have to go. I can't have competing uh, things coming into my sphere of information because then I'm just confused when I go out to the public and message to them. And I need to be consistent uh, on my messaging. So I think it's really important, as Kristen has said, and as Bonnie has said, uh, one source. Uh, of course, I'll always confer with my family doc but I mean, uh, you know, but as far as the, the, my, my public messaging and where I send people to um, each and every day is to here in Perth Public Health, hpph.ca. And if everyone did that, and now we're into the vaccines and everyone is very anxious um, and, you know, and, and sometimes not, you know, communicating properly uh, and, and they're getting angry about it. We need to calm down. Uh, we need to be patient. Everyone is going to be vaccinated and we need to continue that messaging out and be very positive. But my source is HPPH. Well, I'm, I'm glad, uh, Mayor Grace, that you also acknowledged your primary care uh, clinician in there as well. If you have a nice, uh, good relationship with uh, an, in, uh, an individual, if they are managing your health, perhaps they could advise you on a global pandemic and how to navigate that as well. Yeah. Patricia, I'm going to ask you next because I'm leaving the hardest question for Kristen there at the end. <laughs> I'm giving you lots of time Evil to think here. about it though. Um, so I would recommend Public Health Ontario because they have lots of information that's scientific if you want that detail of scientific information about um, kind of evidence about treatments and uh, summaries of studies. They have that detailed information if you want specific studies, but they also have more uh, general summaries about effectiveness of different kinds of masks and things like that, plus information about statistics, etc. Um, so that's Public Health Ontario. Thank you, uh, Patricia. And uh, Kristen, did I give you enough time to come up sure. with another and source? This is, it's not appropriate to send people to my Facebook page now, right? I'm just clarifying. Correct. Yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, um, so I reiterate what everybody said. Here in Perth Public Health, I'm in Grey Bruce, so Grey Bruce Public Health. I use the Ontario.ca website. I use Canada.ca. I also like a couple of communicators on Twitter because what they do is they synthesize the information that you get from all of those sites. So for local regional responses, appropriate gatherings, vaccinations, yes, our public health. But if you want to see what's happening on a grand scale in Canada and in Ontario for vaccination numbers, for um, case counts, for testing, et cetera. There are two communicators on uh, Twitter and I check them every day. And well, I can, I, exactly. I, I, I'm thinking of what Please, one yes, one yes, yes, yes. Is one of them a amazing family doctor from Toronto? Petite, young, beautiful woman. I, I said a family doctor from Toronto. 
Uh, <laughs> yes. Dr. Jennifer. I'm to guide you to me. D- yeah. Dr. Jennifer, Jennifer Kwan. Kwan is genius. She is genius. Her 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 slides are so easy to understand. Um, great graphs so that you can reference where we are in things. Because what's really important is not just point in, in, in of the moment to understand where our cases are today. It's where are they going? Where have they been? Where are they going? Are we testing enough? Because if we're not testing enough, it doesn't matter if our caseloads are down. Maybe we're not capturing those cases. So she she takes the information and she synthesizes them. And who's the other? I don't know, Can't actually. I, I just automatically uh, thought of Dr. Kwan. Jennifer, she is she is genius. Dr. Jennifer Kwan, follow her on, on Twitter. The other is a biostatistician. Uh, he's a high school teacher. Ryan Imgrund. Yeah. And he, what okay. he does is he takes our numbers regionally and stratifies them into colors. It's a really great graph to show you um, how many people you need to be around to risk a 50% exposure to COVID. Um, sh- he shows you um, uh, what your region is in terms of percent positivity and all of those things. So I think you need both. I think Dr. Kwan's graphs are amazing for the information that they tell you. And then I think um, Ryan's graphs are great for the local regional thing. So I recommend Twitter is great. And those uh, profiles are both open. So you don't have to have Twitter to access them. You can Google Twitter, Ryan Imgrun, Twitter, Dr. Jennifer Kwan, and you'll be able to see their profiles and track what they do. And I check both of them every single day. When Dr. Kwan took a very well-deserved day off, I, I missed her information. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, And she Kristen. deserves a day off. Yeah. Um, I, I, looking at the time, we have about three minutes left. So what I'm going to do is give each panel member 30 seconds for final word of advice to the public to getting through this together. And I'm going to start with Bonnie and just follow the same order. Final advice. You don't have to use all 30 seconds. You can just give one word. You can give a gesture, uh, you know, like, but, um, but one final, and I'm, I'm dragging this out. So I'm giving Bonnie time to think because it was, you know, asking her first. Um, and then we'll go back to Gwen to summarize this at the end. So Bonnie, any final words of wisdom to the general public? Yeah, you made me go first. <laughs> um, well, you know, we've all been talking about, you know, how important it is to be kind with each other, and to be patient with each other. And that message is out there a lot. But I have to say, get your vaccines. Okay, get your vaccine. <laughs> Mayor Grace? Uh, I would echo that. Uh, one, uh, stand up and roll up uh, your sleeve, get your vaccine. Are you saying but, roll up the sleeve to win? Yeah, <laughs> more or less. Uh, but I, I want to give a shout out to the, uh, you know, the nurses and the doctors and the practitioners that are delivering this. Everyone is, um, is working uh, their heart out to, uh, and, um, and we need to be patient. But uh, when it's your turn, roll it up. Patricia. I would echo the comments of my previous two panelists here. Um, the other thing, I think we need to be persistent uh, in following public health measures. So whether that's uh, physical distancing, hand washing, mask wearing, et cetera, um, let's stay the course to try to keep as many people safe. And Kristen. Uh, I would like to take my 30 seconds to actually answer the question from the anonymous attendee asking about using lower efficacy vaccines in um, less uh uh, the populations have been less affected. And I want to say this because both my grandma and my mom said, I don't know if I want the AstraZeneca va- vaccine. Currently, the evidence for all three approved vaccines in Canada, AstraZeneca, Pfizer, and Moderna, show that they significantly reduce hospitalization and death and not just the rate of infection. So the AstraZeneca specifically in the study, so this is not real world always, but in the study showed a 100% decrease in severe COVID and death. And that's why we need everybody to accept the vaccine that they are offered first. And then if one is obviously better than the other. We know that our procedures to allow people to have a secondary vaccine will come. So I, I, I encourage everybody to focus their communication because especially with AstraZeneca, it's been, it's been really hot really a lot um, in the last few days. So we need to look at all the evidence and not just infection rates, but overall outcomes on that. And that's where our science communication from all of us, there's, I, I see so many pharmacists um, watching today. So our science communication is really important in that. So I, we're gonna 
I echo again, get your vaccine. And I would like to also thank Dr. Ken Mills for setting this up because this is, or being part of this and inviting me to be part of this because I'm very honored to be sitting anywhere with you. Uh, I always, always look forward to working with you on science communication, Kristen. Thank you. Um, Gwen, can I take 30 seconds? Oh, you can. Okay, here's my 30 seconds. It's okay not to be okay. It has been really hard getting through this last year. Everybody has a story. Everybody has been facing struggles and we should be kinder to ourselves. We don't have to be superheroes. Kinder to each other. Kinder to those people that are keeping food moving, that is keeping healthcare going, that's keeping our transportation industry going, keeping our economy going. We need to be kinder to our community. But if you are struggling, there are resources out there. And I would encourage you to reach out and access those. It's not a sign of weakness to recognize that your cup is full. It's a sign of strength. Wow. Ken, you are hard to follow, trust me. Um, I just want to thank everyone. I know at the beginning, um, I thought, oh, more COVID-19 discussion, you know, when we are so, so inundated with so much and this, we are all in it together. Oh my goodness. We're kind of tired of that one too, aren't we? However, we're all in it now. You have all joined us today. You are a very special panel um, and a very special group. You are leaders in our rural community. And Gateway is all about uh, bringing more information, educating people, that way making them healthier in rural. And I am delighted to be part of this today and to bring this on behalf of Gateway to all of you. Um, so thank you, panelists. Thank you, Ken. You are always um, such a spokesperson for rural and you care so much. So you are a wonderful leader. I ask that, um, I want to thank the sponsors, um, Bruce Power, Larry Ott and Contracting and CIBC Wealth Management. And if you enjoyed today and uh, you know we're a nonprofit charity and we always appreciate any support you may be able to offer us. So thank you so much. And this concludes our one hour of power from Gateway. Thank you so much for joining us. Bye for now. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone. <laughs>